So esophageal complaints are pretty common. If you look at your uh, list of patients that you're seeing daily, you're going to see people with heartburn, dysphagia, and really this is a technology that helps you decide you know, what they have in terms of the diagnosis, but also how to manage them. Well, it doesn't necessarily replace anything, but it actually is a better manometry system. So typically, the paradigm is someone comes in with an esophageal complaint, you always do endoscopy. You need to rule out cancer, inflammatory conditions. Um, but then once you do that, um, you're kind of left with not knowing what's going on, and this is really where manometry comes into play. And certainly, high-resolution manometry is a definite technologic advance, and then esophageal pressure topography is a definite analytic uh, advance. Yeah, it's certainly still a test that patients don't like. It's a transnasal intubation, so it doesn't uh, lead to any less angst about a, a procedure, but certainly it helps define patients, and it really points us in the right direction because the decisions made with manometry typically are either surgery or not surgery. The high-resolution manometry with esophageal pressure topography has increased um, our ability to uh, diagnose uh, patients because it gives us anatomy and, and, and really valid landmarks. And when we have those, we can make better measurements. When we make better, better measurements, we make less mistakes. So from that standpoint, it definitely helps. But it also allows us to phenotype patients better. We've actually been able to see different patterns. We've been able to look at diseases in many different ways. Yeah, really what happened was, was that uh, the technology got better, so the hardware essentially got better, so that we could actually get more sensors closer together. And then actually beyond that, what happened was a gentleman named Ray Klaus came up with a really nice idea on how to change the data from pressure tracings to these color plots. They almost look like images as opposed to just these tracings like an EKG. I mean, I think that's the ultimate goal. It would be great if we could, in fact, you know, do this while the patient is sleeping during their initial endoscopy. Uh, that would save us from having to bring the patient back for another visit and then having them get another um, difficult uh, procedure which is transnasally intubated um, catheter placement. Um, so once again when people hear that they, they tend to want to run away but uh, if we could develop something that was done endoscopically and there are some techniques um, that, that can be thought of uh, that could potentially help us in that respect and one of those is functional lumen imaging probe. Most people will have to buy a new uh, piece of equipment. Um, it's, if you look at the overall expense, the front load is, is definitely more expensive. But if you look at how many procedures you can do with a single catheter, because these catheters are reusable, usually they're guaranteed anywhere 200 to 250 times. So the unit cost is pretty equivalent to what you'd probably see with disposable catheters. Um, but certainly the old, the old catheters, rubber catheters that you had to clean over and over, um, were certainly um, less expensive. But I think this uh, advance in terms of our accuracy and our ability to really see things a lot better really makes that cost worthwhile. Yeah, there's certainly additional training, but to be quite honest, there should have been additional training with the other technology, and I think a lot of mistakes were made with people reading the other technology. The nice thing about this technology is that actually if you look at the reproducibility between investigators and then even trainees, you can really see that trainees adapt very well to this technology. So it might be a lot, lot more user-friendly than what we've had in the past.